started. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the our second speaker for the Word on the Street uh, Fall Reading Series. Um, before we begin this morning, uh, we'd like to give a traditional land acknowledgement that the Lethbridge Public Library acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains to respect the Blackfoot people past, present, and future while recognizing their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. The city of Lethbridge is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. I'm happy to be joined today by Guy Delis. Born in Quebec City, Canada in 1966, Guy now lives in the south of France with his wife and two children. He spent 10 years working in animation, which allowed him to learn about movement and drawing. He is best known for his travelogues about life in faraway countries, the Burma Chronicles, Jerus Jerusalem Chronicles from the Holy City, Yang and Shenzhen. In 2012, Guy was awarded the prize for best album for the French edition of Jerusalem at the Angelum International Comics Festival. Thank you so much for joining us today, Guy. Pleasure. I know that there's, it's, uh, we're in the morning here and I know there's about a seven or eight hour time difference on I'm glad that you were able to take the time out of your day to, to join us. So I thought we would start off, uh, before, well, I should let the audience know if you do have any questions for Yi, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, there'll be the Q&A box. You can just click on that and type in any of your questions. Your video and audio is turned off, but when you type in your questions, I can read them out and uh, I'll let Yi know who uh, posed the question. We'll start out. Your official biography talks about how you're best known for travelogues about life in faraway countries. Could you tell us a little bit about those works? Yeah, uh, my first work started as a, it was a short story actually, because I was, uh, for the for five or 10 years, I started with the, the comic book. Uh, um, it was like it was a magazine, and I was doing short story for that magazine. And when I came back from work, because I was working at the time in animation, um, I took some notes while I was there, and I thought, uh, well, why not make sh a little short story with uh, a few notes that I had uh, and a few funny moments that happened while I was working there in China. Um, and I did the short story of sixteen page. People liked it a lot, and I really enjoyed. Uh, Drawing myself being in in the in the page doing a autobiography uh, formula, and um, I just went on working on a second 16 page for the magazine afterwards, and then we decided, well, you know, people like it a lot, so why not try to make a book with that? And that became my my first traveling book. It was not not planned as a book because that's more than like 15 years ago, and um, the comic book industry was maybe not. Uh, it was a bit new at the time to do that. Uh, not so much these days, of course. And uh, so, yeah, I didn't. I didn't thought first. Uh, I'll make a book. And then I was sent uh, to North Korea. And while I was in North Korea, I took some notes. And uh, I always work the same for these traveling books. Um, take notes, come back, and then uh, if I have enough materials uh, with these notes, then I decide to make a book. Okay. Just out of curiosity, what was North Korea like? It's a place that I'm, I'm sure most of our audience is never, ever going to see. <laughs> and you don't see much about it in the media. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because when, when I do signing, I have people that come to me. And uh, a few of them, once in a while, they, they have been to Pyongyang. Uh, mostly for curiosity, not for work. And um, you can go from Beijing. You can you can have a tour and uh, spend. Uh, it's a bit expensive, but I was on a different situation. I was there for, for work. Uh, believe it or not, there was a time where um, there was lots of outsourcing uh, of animation in North Korea because it was simply the cheap, cheapest way to to do animation. So. Uh, Italians, the Spanish, the French, they were going there. Um, and it was half the price as the Chinese were offering. So for a producer <laughs> in France or in Italy, uh, the math was very simple to do. So I was sent there. Well, I know a lot of people actually in animation of my generation who have been there. And uh, 
that's that I was a bit surprised because when I, I uh, before I went there and I would meet these people, uh, the only thing they would say about the country is that it was very boring because there was no no bar, they couldn't take the taxi, and uh, I knew a bit about the country because it always fascinated me, and um, I thought to myself, well, if I go there, uh, well, at least me, I'll, I I know where I'm gonna go. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's not a touristic place, so I'm not going to complain that there's nothing to do. Uh, and I've read books about North Korea before I go there, all the books I, I could find. And that was in 2001, so it was just at the time uh, not the same as today. Today, of course, North Korea is in the media a lot. Uh, it was not like that at all at that time. Uh, it was before September 11, so there was nothing about the rogue state, the acts of evil. It was just a remote and forgotten country that nobody would talk about, except that, well, it seems to be a very strange and weird place. Yeah. So of all your um, sort of travel logs, do you have a, a favorite one that you've authored and what makes it your favorite? Uh, probably uh, of the one I've done, uh, it's, it's probably the, the one about North Korea. Uh, because that one was the first one that I planned uh, as a book uh, from A to from beginning to end. Uh, I, I thought, well, okay, I'm going to start like that and developed it and, 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 and work as, as a book. So for me, uh, it was it was different than Shenzhen. It was kind of a bunch of short story all, all put together. And the book uh, got a lot of attention from... Uh, the fact that it was North Korea, uh, I mean, um, uh, a magazine that would not talk about uh, North Korea, but uh, I remember uh, Foreign Policy, which is a magazine that never talks about comic book. Uh, they have presented the book and I did a little inter interview for them. So that was a lot of fun. All of a sudden, uh, my book was translated uh, very quickly in the first language was in, in Korean, in South Korea. In Japanese and in all these languages. Um, I, I have 25 lang it's been translated in 25 languages now. Oh, wow. so, yeah, that's, that's a lot. And uh, so, yeah, that's why it, this book's a bit special for me. Okay. So, your most, <clears throat> excuse me, your most recent published work is Factory Summers. For the, those of us, uh, the audience that haven't had a chance to read it yet, could you tell us a little bit about what it's about? Yeah, it's a bit like like a traveling book for me because uh, it, I goes in that remote place. Uh, it's not a country this time; it's a factory because I've been working there was when I was a student for three summer. Uh, my my father worked there all his life, and uh, so I've been able to go where he was working. So that was interesting to see because. Um, my relation with my father is, is very distant. And um, being there for three summers was very interesting to see when you're 16, it was my first job. And when you get to see uh, the people who work in a factory and you're 16, I was an art student. So there was a big gap uh, with me and these workers when I was telling them what I'd like to do someday. Um, and all of these conversations uh, are still very vivid in my mind, even though I don't have a good memory. Um, probably because when you're 16 and it's your first job, you remember a lot about that. So it talks about uh, the work that factory is who's, uh, who's, who's, who's very special. It's in the middle of Quebec City. Uh, everybody knows it because it, there's a lot of smoke, but not a lot of people get the chance to go and, and see it from the inside. So that's what I've done on that book. It talks about the, the teenage time when you... You, you change from teenage to adult and uh, student from work. So it's, 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 these are very important years for me. Okay. So you lived in France for, uh, from what I gather, for over half your life now. What did you decide to revisit this time working in the factory right now? Well, um, I've been thinking about that since I'm 30 years old because uh, it was quite a, a fascinating place with fascinating people uh, in there. Um, and um, when I was 30, I was thinking, well, it's a bit early <laughs> in my time life to uh, talk about my, my memoirs or my souvenirs. So I'll wait a bit. And then now that I'm 50, um, I, I, 
I thought to myself, well, after 50, I will, uh, I might, I might, I might work on books about me me memoirs or something. Yeah. So now I'm 55. So I said, well, okay, I'll try to see uh, what I can do with that book. Uh, books works like that a lot. You have some idea that goes around in your head all the time. And then one day you say, okay, I I'm just going to get rid of this idea because it's been turning in my head for years and years now. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'll see if I have enough material. So I start with just one souvenir I had in my head. I, 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 I wrote that down and uh, I wrote another one. And I was a bit surprised because like I was saying before, I have a very bad memory. And um, it happens that, you know, after a week, uh, all these memories came back and uh, I had enough, uh, enough information and stuff to make uh, uh, a small book with that. So I said, well, okay, let's give it a try. And then I had even more and more coming in. So it's funny how memory works when you start to uh, pull on the thread, it gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, definitely. Was Factory Summers inspired at all by the fact that in addition to you getting older, your children are getting older as well? And that sort of offered a unique perspective on that time in life? Yeah, there's a, a lot of that because my son is, is 17 now. So that's, that's the time where I was working uh, in the summer in the factory. And um, I remember I, I thought to myself, well, I'm going to make a book about how life was, well, because it was a very difficult job and tough because we were working night shift. Uh, it's very hot. It's very noisy. And uh, you're with some big guys that were there all, all, all their life, all year long, basically. And you're just right. students in the middle of that, uh, working there for a few months. So it's a very um, peculiar um, situation. And um, at first, I thought, oh, I'm going to make a book like that. And I, I'm, I'm just gonna, so I'll be able to give it to him. One day I said, you know, at your age, I was working at the factory, like a good old dad can say to their sons, um, in a funny way, of course. And um, yeah, so I worked on that because mainly uh, since uh, he's 17 and 16, I, I, I think to myself, well, you know, what was I doing when I was that age? And uh, I was always going back to uh, that factory. So I thought, well, you know, it'd be fun to make a book about that. How did they react to the book? Did they see themselves working in the same sort of factory at that age or? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, of course. Uh, oh, even though my, so my, my son, yeah, this summer, he went to sell uh, stuff on the on the beach. Um, so yeah. he, he stayed all day long under the sun. So it, that was a pretty tough job. So he, he got to know a bit what it was. Uh, but yeah, it's, they have a very different situation. Even yeah. though I was I was in a very comfortable situation when I was young, it's just that I had the chance to work there and the salary was very good. So that really helped me to pay my tuition to go to um, the animation school afterwards. So, uh, but the, the job was tough, very noisy, very hot. And uh, but at the same time, yeah, it's it's interesting to work in a factory when you're 16 because, uh, well, you know why you go, uh, you know why you you choose special. Um, I mean, when you go back to school <laughs> in September, uh, you know where you, why you're going back to school and, and all the thing that can, you know, it's, 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 it's so it's very important. And yeah. um, it, it, it puts uh, all the stuff you're doing afterwards in perspective, because you know that, you know, you might just end up being working at the factory all your life. Uh, why not? But if you can do something else, why not either? Right. We have a question from Car uh, Caroline. She says that she loved Factory Summers. Can you tell me what are your comic inspirations? Uh, my influence? I mean, my other yeah. influence, she means? Um, I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, I have so much. When I was younger, uh, I read all the Franco-Belgium stuff. So it's uh, Asterix, Tintin, a bit later on, and um, uh, the Smurf. I'm a big fan of the Smurf uh, back in the days, and uh, after that, uh, I've 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 seen the evolution of comic books that changed a lot, and uh, there was that book who changed a lot of things, which is uh, Mouse and uh, by Arch Spiegelman, and um, so of course that book has been a big influence. On top of that, he was doing a autobiography book on his father, so. I was thinking of that when I was doing Factory Summer because I do talk about my father a bit. 
And I guess there's an influence right there. It's such an important book in, in the comic book history that uh, it has influenced most of the comic book artists of my generation that I, uh, I know whenever I ask them the question. So I'm, I'm part of that as well. I still get influenced by young generation. I read mangas. Um, I read um, comic book um, every week. I read uh, two or three comic books because I go to the to the library and I borrow books uh, and um, I read stuff that the young people do. And I think, wow, this is interesting the way they they tell their story and. Um, it's um, it, we live in a time where comic book is is growing very quickly, and there's a lot of talented person and it's uh, people working on comic books. It's a very it's like a golden age of comic book. Yeah. I mean, the time we're living now. Actually, one of the scenes in the Factory Summers, um, you briefly touched how you used to go to the library and read all read everything that the library had to offer as far as graphic novels and comics, and as <laughs> And it really seems like that sort of warmed my heart. It's nice to see how the collections that we we put together for people, it actually does have an impact on people and how they see the world and what they want to do for a living and everything. So it was, it was nice to see that. Yes, because I, I, I really wanted to unface that, that uh, sometimes uh, an artistic uh, parcours, just like myself, uh, started... Uh, with my, my library uh, next door to me, it, I had the chance uh, to be, it was a new library and they had a big row of, of new comic books. They, they were brand new and really in, just in the taste of the time. So it, it was perfect for me. And I've, I've, I've used them. So I've read all the books there, all the comic books. I've used it so much and uh, it stayed in my mind till now. We have a comment from Kelly. She just wanted to say, Guy, I want to say a huge thank you. I found Jerusalem by accident in a tiny comic book store in Calgary around seven years ago. And that I was being dragged to, a, to by a marble addict. Uh, she picked up Jerusalem and flipped through and read a good quarter of it just while standing there. You'll ple be pleased to know that I bought it and then proceeded to buy all of your books. Adult graphic novels are my absolute favorite. And this is all because of you. Oh, oh, thanks for that. <laughs> oh, thanks. She goes on to say, do you, do you and your family plan on traveling more and writing any more travel logs? Uh, we don't have, because um, we knew that we wouldn't work. Uh, we don't travel anymore now. Uh, it might happen later on, but uh, I guess when the kids are going to go away from the house, they're 17 and 15 now, uh, but we knew we didn't want to do that while they were young uh, all their life. So uh, it was important for us to stop. And uh, once in a while, my wife, she says, well, I'd like to do another mission someday. And yeah, yeah, I, I think I'd like to do that. Uh, I'd like to go in the West Africa. Oh. And if, yeah, it's, especially if it's a, a, a francophone French country, mm -hmm. uh, because the way they use the French is it's so poetic. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, and um, just to see some some part of Africa, I've been there a bit. But uh, the thing is, to do a book for me now, um, I have to stay a long time because uh, I cannot do a book like I've done on China. Just stay a few months and work there. I need to have some things specific, something that only me I've seen. Um, so that means to stay in the country, to meet people, and then you discover something that. Well, okay, not every tourist can see that. So, okay, I can do a book with that because uh, I'm never going to do a book about something that is just touristic. Well, this is beautiful. This is nice. For me, I don't want to read that and I don't want to draw that either. Um, so it might, it might happen. We might go back, but that's not in the, in, in the next years. That's going to take uh, five or 10 years. <laughs> Another question we have, uh, this was from an anonymous person. They said, people have said that Factory Summer's main theme is alienation from family, toxic gender roles, co-workers, labor from profit. Would you agree with this? And if so, was this intentional? Oh, that's interesting. Um, 
Why, in order to say yes or no, we would have to, to talk about that and, and, and learn more about the way that person uh, sees that. But uh, there's a bit of that, I guess. But uh, since there's a bit of other things, uh, I mean, I discover I discover comic books, basically. So that was a big thing. And uh, I start to draw and I start to evolve uh, as an artistic person uh, in different direction of drawing. So. I mean that's that that's very positive. So there's a bit of that too. Just it the books I do when they are traveling books or uh, factory summers for me they're kind of patchwork or long postcard I would send to my family. So there's a bit of this, uh, of this and a bit of that, and they all fit together and they makes they make a book. But um, yeah, usually when I go somewhere I take notes and I'm just going to put together whatever. I think it's going to be interesting, fun, and a bit bizarre. And uh, it's a bit like that for Factory Summer. Okay. I had sort of a similar question. And I've seen in some previous interviews with you that uh, they've mentioned that there is unresolved class conflict in Factory Summers. Could you describe how you saw the class conflict in the, the novel or how you meant to portray it? Is there a class conflict in that book? I don't know. I, I've, I've, I would need more, um, more information on that. Oh, between the workers and the workers. Uh, and well, I do talk about that between the engineers and the yeah. workers and the way they would see them. So yeah, I, 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 there's a bit of that, but uh, that's uh, half a page basically. Um, uh -huh. The rest, the rest is basically me with all the different workers that I found strange and funny and weird. But uh, yeah, of course, when the engineer would come down and uh, they would, it, I mean, they have a different life completely. When I went to my father's, he was not an engineer; he was just a draftsman. But um, he, he had uh, he had the environment of an engineer because I would go in his office just one time and. Uh, well, there's carpet on the floor, there's no noise, and uh, it's all very quiet. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is more the kind of job I'd like to do <laughs> someday, um, uh, compared to working uh, night shift uh, in, in, the, in a sweaty and uh, noisy environment. That's, that's very different, of course. But yeah, uh, if there's a bit of that probably in the book, yeah. It's interesting. I sort of thought with the workers in the, the factory, they didn't seem to be, I didn't see there being a lot of conflict with the engineers and stuff, some of the other interviewers had thought. It seemed to me that they were sort of, they knew their role in the factory, they were happy with their work. Um, it didn't seem to be a huge conflict to me, so I was interested to see how what you thought about that. Yeah, I wouldn't say conflict, that's right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, of course, the, these guys' works, they, they, don't, they, they don't have the, the engineer. Um, way of, of not thinking, but it's there are different levels, I guess. But uh, I, I I was in a factory that were um, they were specialist uh, specialist workers. They, they were not like uh, uh, like you see on Charlie Chaplin, just doing always the same. So they they the work needed a little bit of finesse. So these guys were very proud of their work. And uh, I was glad to put that, well, to show that in the book, because I really, I really like these little details of how you put the paper, or you cut it, on you, or you, you put it on the recycle. And it's actually not so easy to do. And uh, these guys have been there, and they have a lot of experience on that. And uh, I had a few um, emails from uh, people who have worked there, who still work there. And they were very happy um, that I would show their job, what they were actually doing, um, because it's a bit uh, they cannot invite people to go in their factory and their family. So they had a book so they could show it around. And I was, I was happy for them that they could use the book in, in that way. Yeah. So throughout the story, your father sort of, how important was he to the story that you were telling? Because it seemed he sort of featured a little bit at the beginning and then he sort of, he's sort of always present throughout the story, but. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a bit, uh, I didn't plan that, but um, for me, the main subject was the factory. But now that I think of it, maybe the main subject was my father, because he passed away like five years ago. And um, I guess that was the trigger for that book. Like 
well now I can I can talk about that factory book and and put my father in the book because uh, uh, I wouldn't have liked to do it while he's still there I think so and um, I had to introduce him in the book because if I work in that factory it's because my father worked there right. and then I had to explain the relation I had with him and at the end uh, since he died uh, yeah just a few years ago um, I had the ending of the book like that. So it was actually there beginning, middle and end uh, all the way, uh, and all the time by a little piece in the book. Uh, and well, I'm glad I did it because it, uh, I, I didn't put it there just because, well, it's, it, 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 there, there was a purpose, I mean, for the story. It, it, it was interesting to put it there. It add more about uh, me, the situation, my relation, and maybe it puts some, uh, lighting on on my other works. I mean, if I do a bad dad guide, maybe that has to do with the relation with my father. So I thought, well, yeah, it was interesting to put that there. Did you ever have any conversations with your father about your work? And did you ever get any insight into what he thought about your art? No, actually, uh, it was not an easy, especially when he was older. Uh, he was not an easy guy to talk to. He was going on his own stuff, and uh, and uh, I was surprised that he had all my books. Well, I remember I was sending my books, uh, doing my my part of being a son. And uh, no, actually, it it seems funny to me even now that uh, I didn't just phone him, or because I I wouldn't phone um, we didn't phone. I would go and see him once in a while, and uh, I would have said, well, did you read my books? Did you like them? But uh, it never happened like that. It was always a very strange and uh, not very uh, clear situation, and he would just go and talk about his stuff. Uh, and then at the end, he would realize that, well, okay, I've, so when I was leaving <laughs> the apartment, he would say, so, and you, how are you doing? Uh, that kind of thing. But I had so many of my friends who said, well, it's funny, I have to kind of the same relation with my father mm -hmm. um, maybe it's a generation thing as well <laughs> yeah definitely i think it, that definitely could be a part of a lot of sort of friends that i have and stuff have mentioned the same sort of thing it was really touching sort of the end of the uh, story when you go to his apartment and you're cleaning it out and you see that he did he kept all your books and that that sort of realization that they were there so yeah, I was surprised to see them because that was, uh, well, okay, I, I I was there somewhere in that apartment. Uh, and I remember there was a few, uh, uh, a few, uh, a few signing I did to him at the beginning. And uh, it was interesting to see that. And I thought, well, I wonder what he thought about my books. <laughs> but, well, that's just the way it is. Yeah. But that's somehow, yeah, that's, that's the way he chose things to be. Uh, which is weird. I mean, I have children now, so I can see the way he was seeing things. And uh, I don't know, it's such a waste to not uh, take full advantage of your children and get to know them and, and get to participate to their life. He was not in, in that at all. So that was his choice, basically. Yeah. We have a question from Mel. She, uh, they mentioned you, that you started pulling, you, you mentioned that when you started pulling the thread, the memories came back. How were you reaching into these memories? Was it mainly through drawing or writing? And could you, how would you describe the difference between writing about your memories and drawing part of the memories? Oh yeah, that's interesting because uh, it's a bit of all that. Uh, memories can be triggered by smell, by all sorts of things. I went back to the factory to take pictures. I, I got in contact with someone who actually knew my father, so that was that, that was easier because they don't they don't accept people in that factory. Uh, and I went there and I took a few pictures. And uh, when I pushed the doors and I heard the noise, uh, the, the the temperature, and and specifically the smell of uh, sulfite and paper. Uh, and then I, I thought I was I was back to 16 years old. It was crazy. Yeah, the smell is so strong. But that triggered a, a bit of memory while I was there and taking pictures. But um, it's just um, the filter of memory, basically. E everything, all these conversations I had with these guys that were a bit shocking, a bit strange for me. 
and some of them very funny. Uh, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna forget the night where they said, "Let's sleep uh, on, on turns," and I slept under one of these machines, <laughs> and it was very noisy. I'm never gonna forget that. And while I was writing, uh, it was mostly by writing. I, uh, I said, "Yeah, sleeping under the machine," and then uh, that guy, Mark who wanted to have his, his muscles getting bigger. So he wanted to be a, a professional uh, weightlifter. Uh, I'm not going to forget that. And it came back. And while I was working on the book, because you go into details and you go into the drawings and you almost live in, in, in your memory, but in three dimension almost, um, some of these memories come back by the drawings as well. So I thought, oh yeah, there was this as well. Um, the book was finished. and. Uh, I was shaving in the mirror, and then I noticed that I have like a little scar here. And I, I thought, where is that from? And then I remember, yeah, that was in the factory when I was trying to uh, open one of these core and uh, unscrew it. And then it slipped and it hit me. And uh, it was not much, but it was bleeding. So uh, all the guys came around and uh, they, they put me in that little cabin and then uh, they, they stopped me for a while to rest and all that. And um, when you're young, you don't like that because uh, it's kind of a weakness. And uh, I wanted to show that in the book. It was, and then I said to the publisher, the book was all finished. I said, oh, I still have one page to add in the book. <laughs> and she was going crazy. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, it was, I'm glad it's in the book. When it comes to when you talk about some of the, your memories there, and um, there's a couple characters, Mark, like you just mentioned, and um, I think the other was Jake, who passed away. Yeah. They're featured quite heavily compared to some of the other sort of characters that sort of just pop in for a moment and pop out. Did they have a particular impact on your life that you decided to include them? Well, yeah, when I was there, I've, I've once in a while, I, I go back and my, mem my memory comes back to me, uh, it would be more precise to say, and uh, I talk about these two guys, and uh, and even even the one that are not very important in the book, I remember this old guy that he would come uh, and he says that uh, he liked to work, he liked to work there because he would do a, a bit of exercise doing that, and uh, he seemed old, but he was still working there. And uh, I, I remember him very vividly because the guy next to me said, well, when is he going to quit so I can have his job? And I thought, well, that's really mean <laughs> to say that. Uh, but at the same time, it was true. I mean, the old people, they have to, uh, to, to give their job away some, at some point. And uh, yeah, some of them needed more time because uh, Jake, for example, I, I saw him for a, a summer and I think he would have became a, a friend and I would have been very interested to see how he has evolved because he was uh, one of the only guys uh, working there who had a book in his hands and uh, um, other than the students. And, uh, and then I, I, I realized that he was taking, he told me he was taking a night class uh, to uh, psychology. I thought, well, that's, that's you know, yeah. that's, that's very surprising and interesting. And, you know, the summer after I learned that he had an accident and he was just, uh, yeah, he passed away. So yeah, that was this. I thought, wow, I mean, he was young. He looked really nice as well. He, had, he, he looked pretty cool. And uh, well, that's life. What can you do? And uh, when you're 16, 17 and uh, uh, you're in front of that, you think, wow, okay, let's, uh, let's uh, enjoy whatever we have in front of us. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from an, another anonymous question. Was there any things that happened in the factory which you felt were not appropriate for the book? Um, I think I've put most of the stuff. I mean, you have, uh, you have limits, but uh, it's not because it's not appropriate. Because some of the some of the dialogues I had with these guys, I mean, some of them were very vulgar. I put that in the book because you know we are all adults. Uh, we can take it now. Uh, I thought that was interesting to put that in the book. Um, but there's some limits to comics. I mean, the, 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 it's really hard in comic books. Uh, I was confronted to that um, to uh, express the sound. I mean, you cannot 
you can, you cannot put uh, the sound all the time because it doesn't make sense. But I was, and, and same for the the heat, the sweat. You can put sweat, but uh, and uh, the smell. All of these things they don't uh, they don't work really well. And that's all I had in the book basically. But it was much more uh, hot. It was like working in a sauna. So you can say that it's like working in a sauna, but if you don't feel it, uh, it's not the same. Uh, in a movie, you can do that, but not so much in a comic book. It's more difficult. So these were the limits, but it's not because it was not appropriate. Do you find that there's more pressure on yourself when you're creating something that portrays your own past compared to something that's entirely fiction? Do you feel like there's some, you need to get things right Oh yes, uh, yeah. I would uh, I would never put fiction in something that uh, I I say uh, to myself and to other people. It's uh, memories from when I was young, uh, and uh, I was there. I saw these people. I had these conversations with these people, and I put them as faithfully as I can. Uh, I would never put fiction in the middle of that just to make the book look better because usually I don't need that. Um, I, there's enough crazy stuff happening around even when I'm traveling it's just a way of telling a story that's going to make it um, work or not work uh, and a sense of rhythm as well these are very two important things but uh, I really like to I really enjoy to put myself in the books um, because it gives more possibilities uh, for narration you can do the dialogue. Uh, you can have a, a voice that is going to be off at some time. So you have a full spectrum of narration that are very, very uh, uh, rich, and uh, I, I like that. That's why um, I'm, I'm maybe not going to do a traveling book, but uh, I'm going to do autobiography books, like I, I've done with uh, uh, these funny story with my children, like. The, Okay. Bad dad guy in English it's different, but uh, it's in French it's the bad dad guide, and um, uh, I'd like to explore more stuff like that with autobiography. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kelly asks, um, aside from your favorite uh, travelogue being uh, the one with North Korea, do you have a, a favorite book overall out of everything that you've written, and how come? Oh. That I, I really like uh, the one uh, it's uh, the Pyongyang. Yeah, I like that one. But on the traveling book, but on the other books, one I've, I'm I'm really glad uh, and a bit proud. Um, it's it's the, in English. It's uh, uh, the hostage uh, the hostage book where I, I talk about uh, for once not me but someone else that I've met uh, in Doctors Without Border uh, who have been kidnapped for three months. And uh, he managed to escape. And uh, he told me all of his book, uh, all, all of his story. And I put that into a book. And uh, it was a very long process for me. And uh, I really, I really like that book because uh, it's such an incredible story. And it was interesting for once to put my all my energy on someone else's story for once. Yeah, uh, I, that's a book I, I, I really like. Okay. Um, do the books change tone for you when they're translated, um, given that they're originally written in French? And... Uh, the one in English, I do have long conversation with the translator, especially mm -hmm. for humor, uh, because sometimes it's good to have uh, uh, one word who's going to finish the sentence so there's more impact. And, uh, and I have, uh, so I, I'm translated by the same person that John Cortely since I'm there, and uh, we always have these moments where um, we discuss. Well, English is not my native language, as you can hear, and uh, it's uh, sometimes I have, she has. I mean, uh, I have discussion, and then I said, "Can we say this and this?" And then she tells me, "No, that sounds strange." Well, she, she's she's the translator, so I ha she has all my my trust. But it's interesting to have that. So the English translation is very, very close. And she even pushed that to, uh, she got in contact, the translator, uh, to uh, with some workers at the factory that are English, uh, English uh, speakers to make sure that the translation would be uh, faithful. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned earlier that um, about you taking the nap underneath the machine. And <laughs> it was so funny when I read that, I was like, this can't be real. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's te absolutely terrifying. <laughs> yeah. And I'm in the same situation. Like, okay, this is a joke. I mean, we're not going to really sleep under a machine. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, what kind of, of prank is that? And, uh, but no, it goes and he says, yeah, I put paper and go sleep. And I says, okay, I'm going to pretend I'm doing it just to see his reaction. And then, no, it's actually real. So I'm under there <laughs> sweating like crazy and with a noise. I mean, just, I don't know if anybody has ever slept there. But uh, so I spent an hour waiting and uh, that was actually weird because I couldn't sleep. And I, I was almost thinking, I think I would rather work <laughs> than be there. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very interesting description and the I just it was just something that I couldn't even imagine it so it was interesting that it came out yeah and it was such a, a special moment that uh, I, I I do spend one or two three page on that uh, to build the story because otherwise uh, you don't feel it and I wanted the, the reader to to feel just like me, this crazy situation. So uh, that's what I like about comics. You can spend time, uh, you can spend three time, uh, three pages on a little story like that, and then you go faster on some something else uh, yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Could you just talk briefly about your portrayal of the actual factory itself? It seemed in the beginning that it was described as just so noisy and the smell, but over time you sort of talked about the architecture and how there was some sort of some beauty to that. And then there was a scene where you went up onto the roof of the factory that really sort of, it seemed like it was this whole sort of different world. Mm, yeah. And it's really how that whole story ended to me. I mean, a few days after that, I stopped working there. And uh, so, so the last days I was on the roof looking at the sun coming up and it was crazy beautiful. Uh, and yeah, and I put uh, and I wanted to put the story of of the well in Canada, like you know, of course. Uh, I mean, pulp and paper is very important factory. It was uh, probably the most important uh, right from the beginning. I mean, the furs, of course, but then the wood and the paper, and it's been going on. I mean, uh, these machines have been there. When you look at these machines, they have been brought from um, from England in 1929, and they are still running. I mean. Gee, gee, you get okay. some engineers. <laughs> you get some engineers behind that that make these machines. So it's 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 very fascinating to see that, and it's 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 a big part of our history in Canada. And when you think of these guys who were cutting woods, um, uh, and and putting that in in the river, and it's still there. They work. I mean, um, and the people that are in there, uh, and and the workers. They do feel that that they are part of, of the history, especially now that these uh, a lot of them are closing, closing down. Uh, it's just like in Quebec, uh, all over Canada, of course, all over the world. And um, the good thing is the one in Quebec is still running. Uh, when I was there, there was a thousand two hundred people working in the factory. That's a lot of people. And now it's half. It's like six hundred. Uh, it's 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 shrinking. And someday it's going to be, I think it's going to, someday it's going to be over. I mean, the paper, who reads newspaper these days? Not so much. Eh? Uh, and, and I hope they're going to keep the factory. Uh, I mean, this building, it's Art Nouveau. Can you believe that? It's a factory, pop and paper factory. And it's, it, it has the design of an Art Nouveau uh, chic building from New York because it, it has been, with that in mind, and uh, it, it has that mix of uh, of a factory, but a, as a very chic palace at the same time. So it's a strange feeling, and uh, it's only while I was doing all these details about the architecture that I realized that ah, oh, that's what happened when I was young and I was looking at that factory. It's that mix of beauty and big factory with smoke all around that kind of struck me as being bizarre. And I would look at that factory and think, wow, this is strange. And it has a special place for people who live in Quebec because it's really right there. I mean, you, you see it all the time. 
and uh, yeah, it's like a castle in the middle of the city. <laughs> Very cool. So one last question before we let you go for the evening. Do you have any uh, upcoming projects that you can tell us about? Well, actually right now, for the first time in my life, I'm working on someone else's scenario. So it's actually uh, uh, two scenarists. They do, uh, it's, it's kind of children fantasy uh, world and uh, they have guests. Uh, they have like 36, it's, it's called Donjon, Dungeon. And uh, it, I'm, I'm drawing uh, their scenario. And it's a lot of fun. I'm having so much fun because I, <laughs> it, it's only animals, and I'm I'm drawing zombie people, and then I'm gonna draw uh, dragons and elves, okay. uh, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and um, it's a lot of fun. In France, there's has been so many talented uh, artists who have uh, been guests in that uh, series that it's kind of a to be part of that. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Um, for our audience, I just want to put out a reminder that our next uh, fall reading series session will be next Thursday on October 21st, where we'll be hosting Kevin Van Tegum, where he'll be discussing his book, uh, Wild Roses Are Worth It, Reimagining the Alberta Advantage. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you again for joining us, Keith. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye-bye.